So thanks Aditya for those uh, very kind words. Obviously personal bias of a dear friend, so discount it as much as you can. Um, when Aditya told me to get a few slides, um, I prefer not having slides because today is all about telling you a story. Um, when I joined the company 10 years back, we were 500 crores. Today, uh, with my father's vision, we're a 5,000 crore company in Pune. We have over 10,000 employees, 60% of our business uh, comes from outside India, and over 600 scientists work in our facility in Hinjewadi. So truly a 10x story just in 10 years, but when he founded in 1983, obviously a much larger growth story. So I'd like to begin my story of this crazy, brave visionary, my father Satish Mehta. When he graduated, after he graduated from IIM Ahmedabad, he refused to join his father's uh, retail store and um, the risk taker that he is decided to start his own manufacturing unit in pharmaceuticals. That was way back in 1983. Took the slightly safer method of contract manufacturing for a lot of multinationals like Pfizer, Glaxo, the big names, to make medicines, um, their medicines for the Indian market. That was a really smart beginning because what that gave the company is a gene of a multinational. Because whether it's a Pfizer or a Glaxo or a Roche, there would be these continuous audits on a quarterly basis. The team uh, from abroad would come and you know micro, micro sort of analyze every small little system and process. And I think that's what really gave us our foundation and gene of a multinational. Sometime around 1995 is when he decided that, you know, I need to get out of this low margin business and uh, start making my own products. And everyone advised him against it because by 1995, for anyone who follows pharmaceuticals, there were some giant industries um, or Indian multinationals, like you call them, as well as a lot of foreign multinationals had set up their Indian arms. So everyone advised him not to go or foray into this for the simple reason that it was extremely crowded, extremely fragmented, the typical management case study of low barriers to entry and why do you want to get into this. But again, the risk taker, um, you know, contrarian that he is, he decided to set out on his own. When we started manufacturing medicines for the Indian market under the MCUR name, our own branded generics, we were ranked 128th by IMS, which tracks pharma industry. Today, as we speak, we're top 10 in India. And that's truly, truly been an incredible growth path. Today, when you look at any, any therapeutic area, so we're strongest in women's health. Our biggest brand is Anemia, which is a 350 crore brand for us, Oro for XT. But if you look at any therapeutic area, whether you talk about, you know, gynec, hypertension, diabetes, oncology, nephrology, neurology, I mean, you name it, derma, we're there in every therapeutic area. And um, in a lot of these therapeutic areas, we beat the old timers to get uh, dominant positions in those, in those areas. So once again, he proved that he can make a mark there. Then in 2000 thing, uh, 2001, he did the craziest thing of his lifetime. This is when he got private equity investment, got crazy amount of loans, and decided that he wants to set up these US FDA facilities. Um, and exactly what he did in India, which is make for multinationals, but for the Indian market, he wanted to now make for multinationals, but for the US market. So become a contract manufacturer for the multinationals, but sell in the US. Now that is a crazy game, because let me explain it to you. The day you take your bank loan, and the day, it takes you anywhere from two to three years just to set up a US FDA facility because that's the kind of, um, you know, infrastructure and systems you need. After you get that, it takes about a year to get the US FDA approval. So that's four years of just um, a CFO's nightmare, like I call it, because it's operating expenses, you've got to keep the systems running, it's huge capex, huge debt, huge interest cost, just a PNL nightmare. You do that for four years, and it's not like the money comes in after four years, because then after four years, when you've got the USFD approval, you go and pitch to multinationals. You go abroad, and then you just hope and pray that a Pfizer will give a gentleman like Satish Mehta and a private company that no one has ever heard of, and a city like Pune that, again, no one's ever heard of, uh, their business, right? 
but he managed to do that. But hold on for a minute. Once you get the business, there's tech transfer. So that takes two years. So to put things into perspective, from the time you get that bank loan till that first rupee hits your top line, it's a six-year waiting period. And that is what I call an entrepreneur. If you really want to understand the definition of an entrepreneur, there are a lot of buzzwords, but I think this story just says it all. Um, he took that risk. He built world-class facilities. We have 11 facilities at this point. We have uh, beautiful facilities in uh, Jammu, Sikkim, Bangalore, Kurkum, Hinjewadi right here in the US. Um, and he's done a remarkable job. So that was in 2001. But then again, here's a man who doesn't believe in resting or taking it easy or maybe taking an early retirement and doing some philanthropy. No, he just keeps going. So in 2011, again, he's like, I need to do something. And that's when he decided to make his very first acquisition. So MQ has always um, sort of believed in the build versus buy uh, mentality or whatever you, know, you want to call it. And 2011 is when he realized that, that if he wants to sell in the US market his own products, like he did in India, um, he would need to partner with somebody just because to build the relationships with the four top distributors is not something that happens quickly. Um, and then get the paperwork, get it, you know, get, get, get into their systems. It takes a while. And that's when in 2011, he bought a virtual company. The reason I say virtual is that no manufacturing, no R&D, just a team of people who did marketing and had relationships with the distributors. So in 2011, he bought that company when they had a turnover of 11 million US dollars. And today, uh, this year, we're going to exit at 300 million US dollars. So that's what he did with that company. What he did is he bought their marketing bandwidth. And then he had the R&D in Pune. He had the manufacturing in Pune. So it's a beautiful case study of vertical integration. Once that was a success, then again, the man never rests. He decided to do that in London. He decided to do that in Canada. And, you know, like... Um, Aditya just mentioned the string of pearls philosophy or an acquisition after acquisition that makes sense continued. Life is never easy for an entrepreneur and uh, he's had a set of challenges so it's not that uh, everything just worked out great. My memories of growing up were that um, there would be phone calls and he would tell my mother, Bolo ke ghar pe nahi aap, kal subay das baje phone kare because at 9 o'clock that check would hit uh, the banks and at 10 o'clock he'd be able to pay the creditor. So my father went bankrupt almost twice in this journey of taking the company to 5,000 crores and um, I remember those days when we were almost bankrupt and people advised him to shut down the business were not easy days for him but uh, he never showed it. You know, so maybe the little bit of iota of positivity is a genetic disorder that comes from him because he is an eternal optimist. Just about three years back, he had the biggest blow of his career. He's 68, works harder than anyone I know. I mean, he'll come from the US at 2 in the morning, wake up at 5 for his yoga. He's at work at 7. Just the most high integrity, hardworking person, obsessed with the company MQ. But three years back, he had the most terrible thing happened to him because his very first acquisition, he bought it from two brothers um, and he believes, he's always believed in having multiple entrepreneurs. So we joke in the family that everyone's a CEO and we're not, the family is the only one who's not a CEO because he's got some really good professionals by making them CEOs and by giving them equity in the company. So when the company goes public, they've got skin in the game. So that's exactly what he did in the US, but this time it didn't work. Uh, the two gentlemen backstabbed him. They had got into all sorts of messy business in the US. We fired them the very next day. But for three years, he had to go through a very tough time with the legal department in the US. And um, I don't know how he dealt with it, but he always dealt with it with a smile on his face. He's had issues uh, running into you know, regulatory issues with the factories, where the factories got shut down by the US authorities for two, three years. But the, you know, um, we, we've been asked to talk about key takeaways. And I think one of the biggest takeaways about him is, yes, he was a risk taker, is a risk taker. Um, yes, he's an eternal optimist. But the most important thing is that it's always planned. There's always a checklist. And he always leads by example. He works harder than anyone I know. 
and he knows the pulse. So there are times that we'll be sitting in a meeting and the way he's divided the business is I look after the India business which is 40% of the sales. So the CFO title is I was telling Aditya redundant because a year and a half back I got to control the top line which is more exciting. Um, my brother controls Europe and my husband controls US. So they're very clear demarcations which I'm very happy because I never see my husband and brother which I think is the best kind of succession planning because we all have our own things to do otherwise a type A personalities we'd end up killing each other. So um, anyway coming back to Satish Mehta the, the point I'm making is when he sits in review meetings with us um, so for example me I'm just looking at that India business he's looking at emerging markets Europe, US India, R&D, manufacturing, he's looking at everything. Everything's in his head. So God forbid, out of my 300 brands, if he's going to ask me one brand, what was the sales in December and the growth percent in volume and value terms? And if I make the mistake of opening my laptop, I'm finished. Right? Because why is it not in your head? Are you not looking at it every day? Doesn't it give you sleepless nights? Aren't you thinking about it? Why do you, why do you need to open a laptop to look at your core business and your core numbers? And then the tanas start, right? You guys are lucky. Second generation. Got it all ready made. You, know, you don't have to work hard, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, to avoid all of that, we make sure that when we walk into meetings with him, we're really prepared, we've memorized everything, have those little post-it cards while brushing our teeth, that, oh, this is what it is. Um, so he keeps us on our toes. But it's beautiful because we're learning every single day. And it's an honor and a privilege to learn from the best. And um, don't get me wrong, we have our fights. I'm a very strong-headed person. So are my siblings, my husband. So we get into our powwows, but we always walk out with a, with a decision and then everyone sticks with it. Um, and, some, and sometimes the best decisions come out of disagreement. So definitely um, a fun and very exciting journey. Uh, personally for me, when I joined the company 10 years back, um, it wasn't easy because uh, there's no credibility for a second generation. People don't take you seriously. I think in my case, two things helped me when I joined. Number one, get, having a CA, MBA degree and having worked for six years in a company other than my father's gives you a credibility, certain amount of credibility when you join. Secondly, I was very persistent if I wanted to change something because I was all about since I'd worked in the US I was all about you know, like we just discussed putting systems in place Having a leadership bandwidth at level 2 level 3 level 4 I was very passionate about that And so every time I would um, suggest Salesforce automation or things like that um, And there'd be pushback. I think my one quality that helped me is um, I'd be persistent and keep on at it till I think they were sick of me and told me to do it just because they were sick of me. So that was in the initial two, three years when the credibility wasn't built. Um, after that, when my own personal confidence was built, I don't want to, you know, when we get passionate, we overrun our time. I've got two more minutes, two more minutes. So uh, bottom line is that um, when, um, after a couple of years, my credibility was built, or rather, I don't think the credibility ever gets built. Uh, but your confidence gets built and you become more thick skinned as you get more white hair I guess. Um, so I think after a few years um, and even if you see me now, I just bulldoze my way. I don't really wait for people to give me permission. I do what I feel is right and not everything I do ends up correct. I've had my share of failures but I want to learn from my failures by trying my own things. Um, and I think that's the beauty that, um, you know, we try a lot of different things. We fail in some, we learn in others, but it's been an exciting journey. I'm personally very passionate about having more women in our company. So I see a decent percentage here, but we started programs like Prerna, where we really work hard with speaker sessions, mentoring, networking to get more women in the company. I think women need to get rid of guilt. Um, you know, it's like, damn if you do, damn if you don't. If you're working, you're guilty, you missed a PTA meeting. If you're a housewife, you're guilty, you wasted your degrees. So just get rid of the damn guilt, you'll be 10x more productive. So I tell my women that all the time, you know, get rid of the guilt, become a little selfish, learn to promote yourself. So I have my own Instagram page, I, you know, I'm, I'm very open to media, I'm out there speaking, talking, I think there's nothing wrong in speaking up and um, getting yourself out there. So I think this is what I tell our women at MQ, and we have a lot of fun together. I think women in positions of power like me need to do that extra bit 
to have a higher percent of women in the workforce. So these are my few um, key takeaways. I'm sorry I will not be able to wait for the Q&A session, but um, I did want to come by and share our story with you. I will share my email ID with Aditya. So any of you who'd like to visit our facility in Hinjavadi or have very specific questions on any of these phases that I talk about, uh, spoke about, please feel free to email me and I will get back to your questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Namita, um, for bringing that energy that you spoke about about your father through you. And I think your father would be really proud to see that kind of energy that you have. And what a definition of an entrepreneur. Can you wait for six years? And uh, doesn't it give you sleepless nights? My God, that's going to stay with me for a long time. Uh, thank you, Namita. I'm going to request uh, my friend Hitendra Pratap Singh, who also works with Namita and they work together in the Young Entrepreneurs Association, to come up and present Mr. R. Gopal Krishnan's book, Crash. Oh, I'm so glad he gets to present to me. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, okay.